Now, in case some of you get tired of seeing my face this morning, just raise your hand. Either you can come up and stand in front of me or ask me to turn around and face the back. I'm totally flexible either way. But I'm excited to bring you a message that God's put on my heart this morning. It continues in the worship series, and hopefully you'll be blessed by it this morning. And you may notice that we sang hymns this morning. And there's a reason for that. A lot of the theology of what we just sang, you're going to see again. Hopefully it'll be reinforced. But let's pray first. Father, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity we have to gather together as your people, as your church to spend time together with you. And Father, I pray now as I bring this message that you laid on my heart that my ears would be totally open to you. And nothing of myself would come out, Father, but all what you want to share. And Father, may even my ears be open to the, the entire message to you to move as you direct. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, for the last several Sundays, Lee's been doing a series on worship, and I say I'm going to continue that this morning. But the main thing I want to focus on and, and make sure everyone feels comfortable with this, the purpose of this series is not to condemn anyone or to make you feel somehow that your worship is inferior to anybody else in here. I still have an awful lot to learn about worship. I learn something new every time I sit before Jesus and let him minister to me. And I don't think we'll all get it right until that marvelous day when we get to see him face to face. Amen. So this is the purpose of these messages, and particularly my message this morning, is to just to encourage you to come along closer. Join me in singing. Uh, sing your own song, a song that God gives you. So that we are encouraged as, as, as the body. Because when you think about it, the person you're sitting next to, you're going to spend eternity with. Amen. <laughs> that just came out of nowhere. <laughs> so if you want to change seats, now's the time to do it. <laughs> now, I believe that one of the natural progressions as we, as we work out the salvation of our soul as we love Jesus more, as we understand his, his, his love for us more, we understand deeper the, the depth of our sin and why his, his love and his sacrifice is so important. Working out the salvation of our souls, we're naturally led, I believe, into a deeper level of worship and a deeper uh, knowledge of him. But the title of my message this morning is Worship. What's love got to do, got to do, got to do? <laughs> Those of you who know Tina Turner, I couldn't resist. It's the only moment of levity in the entire message this morning. <laughs> no, levity is the opposite. Anyway, so the, what's love got to do with worship? As I was thinking about it, quantum physics came to mind. What would I say in the message this morning? Why do we sing? Can we sing too much? Why do we use hymns, choruses, gospel songs, etc.? What makes good worship? Why are we drawn to worship? And then how do I feel? How do I know when I've had a marvelous, deep worship experience? But let's get the first rabbit trail out of the way. Does anyone know when the word worship is first used in the Bible? Nope. Good guess. Genesis 22. God instructs Abraham to take your son Isaac and go to this mountain, to this place I will show you and, work, and offer up a burnt offering to me. We see it in Genesis 22, 5. So Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go yonder and we will worship and return to you. Again, so Abraham obeyed God. He gathered up these two young men, some firewood and his donkeys, and took Isaac, and off they went. And on the third day, they arose, and Abraham says this and used the word worship for the first time. 
But I couldn't help by thinking, my mind's going off, well, what constituted worship to Abraham at this point in time? We know God said, do a burnt offering, so that had to be part of it. And that's the first time burnt offering, by the way, is used in the Bible. It's in Genesis 22. And why did Abraham not allow the two young men to go with him? Did worship to, to Abraham at this time include laying down on his face before God on a spot? I, we don't know. But I think it's interesting that in the, in the context of the first time the word worship is used, it had to do with an offering. But I rejoice in Psalm 51, 15, 16, 17. For thou dost not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. Thou art not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. And so the offering that I try to bring as I'm working out salvation of my soul is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. But I'm going to jump the gun. I'm going to go ahead and tell you why I think we worship, at least why I worship. My conclusion is the source of motivation so if one or two of you feel like you don't want to sit here for a couple hours and be swayed by my conclusive and convincing arguments, then you might be able to skip out. But we will call you out if you do. Why do we worship? I believe in my heart, worship is driven by an understanding of my sin and my love for Jesus who took my sin away. If I don't fully understand the depth of my sin and why his sacrifice was necessary, then what's, why, how can I love him? I just love him for being a nice guy or a nice person. But I need to understand what he died for. And understanding that, then the deeper my love for Jesus, the deeper my worship. So what's love got to do with it? Some of you may have seen a series on Christianity that Andy Stanley recently did. He's the son of Charles Stanley, that well-known preacher in Atlanta. And Andy has a ministry in the Atlanta area. And he did this series. It followed, actually, uh, Saturday Night Live, Saturday night, for about eight weeks. And he still got another series going. Now, I thought it was excellent. And the, the, the motivation for the message, I believe, there are a number of people now that are becoming disenchanted with the term Christian mm -hmm. and being associated with people we call Christians and Christianity as a definition. And so Andy was making the argument that because Christian is not defined in the Bible, Jesus never called his disciples Christian or his followers Christians that we are free to define Christianity or my Christianity any way I want to, based on my theology or my beliefs, uh, my lifestyle, my point of view, whatever I decide I, I, meets my definition of Christian, I can do it. And one of the reasons that Christianity is, is, or the term is somewhat out of favor now, in the name of Christianity, crusades have been uh, conducted. Slavery was justified. And even in churches today, you see that their condemnation of a lifestyle, condemning not just only the, the conduct, but the person, is a common thing. If you don't believe the way we believe, then you're going to hell. And we don't want to associate, we want nothing to do with you. And unfortunately, that's, that's, the, that's the case in many churches across our country today. But Jesus did not call his followers Christians, as I said before. What did he call them? In John 13, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even if I have loved you, and that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. How different would our world, our country, our city, our state, our city, our church be if love was the motivation for everything we did. If we followed what Je Jesus defined the term disciple, you'll be my disciple if you love each other and love others. 
Anyone that walked into a church service, if love was the most important thing, the, the obvious thing there, there'd be no offense. There'd be no people con condemning a church that wants to grow because it didn't meet certain definitions or didn't meet our building codes because love is evidently there. What an attraction that would be. But Jesus goes further in Mark 12, 29 and 31. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. This is in response to this young Pharisee student of the, of, the, of, the, of the Old Testament who said, what's the greatest commandment? So Jesus responds this way. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. Again, it gets back to the theme of love. If we're truly loving one another, if we truly love other people, then our conduct towards them would be entirely different. We wouldn't see the things that we find offensive. We wouldn't see the things that maybe disturb us. We would see someone who needs Jesus. And then in John 14, 15, verse 15 and verse 23, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Now we all know these verses, we've heard them a lot. But I believe if we don't love Jesus or we don't really have love for one another, we can't really worship the God of the universe. We can sing some nice pretty songs and we can feel good and warm ourselves up, but if we really don't have this love for Jesus or for one another, our worship is missing something. So for me, love, it's the motivation, it's the source. I want to talk for a minute about the difference in private versus corporate worship. To me, private worship is, can be more intimate, more expressive, louder, freedom, because private worship is just between you and Jesus. And I find myself, as Lee mentioned last week, many times, when I've, and I've shared this story, I put my gospel CD, I've got 10 of them that I put in a stack there in order, and when I pull out of my driveway to head to Tennessee, first one goes in. And before I know it, I'm in Salida, Kansas. And I don't know how I got from here to there, unless I have to make a pit stop along the way. But, but you, can lose, you can lose yourself totally, in private worship holler and scream and cry what, whatever the spirit leads you to do is the freedom to worship in private but corporate worship by its nature needs to be a little more restrained we can still have intimate worship but in our worship service here that we just had you might have an unsaved person or a person that's new to the faith who may get freaked out by some manifestations that, that are biblical and the Spirit says it's fine to do. But Paul uh, cautioned us to be, make sure your services are orderly. And so we need to be somewhat cautious, a little more laid back or uh, restrained in our corporate worship. And I think the other, the other reasons for corporate worship is to increase the fellowship among the body, to increase our faith, to be an encouragement to each other, to hear words of prophecy, to minister to each other in, in, in acts of healing and so forth. A number of things can happen in corporate worship. But it's a little different than private. And I'd encourage you, if, you're not, if, if anyone's not doing a lot, enough private worship, get into it. It's a marvelous way to spend some time, and the time will go past so fast. Other reasons to be cautious in corporate worship is that sometimes excessive uh, displays can be unsettling to us. And I attended a church once. Uh, the denomination is still active, but it's had its problems where people believed a variety of things were of the Spirit. Holy laughter. Holy, I mean, laughing, rolling on the, on the ground, barking like dogs. They read a different Bible than I do. 
I'm not saying in private worship, maybe that's what the Spirit might lead you to do, but in corporate worship with other believers, I think we just need to be careful. And that's why the church leadership has to be aware of what's going on and to encourage us to have the freedom to worship, but to understand that we're not in it by ourselves. And I think many of these things, these displays that I call them, are not of the Spirit. A lot of people think Satan's afraid of those back doors. The walls don't mean anything to him. He's more than happy to come in and disrupt someone trying to get to know Jesus. Elias provided some direction in how to prepare for worship. Last couple of Sundays he's done that. Now I want to look at some ways in which we worship. Why do we sing? I can make that a question. I'll, I'll think. Well, anyone want to venture guess why do we sing? If you want to kill 30 seconds to hours, do an inquiry on Google of why do humans sing or what. It's, ama it's amazing what you'll find. And there are a lot of what are, are deemed scientific studies. You know, and, and there's deep, I mean, there's deep thought in this. At the end of the day, no one knows. I think as Christians we know, we'll talk about it in a second. But I was, as I'm thinking about this, said, what do you think motivated our, one of our early ancestors to sing? Now, it might have been a beautiful sunrise or sunset, flowers or some scenery, a waterfall or river, I don't know, or perhaps an attractive member of the opposite sex that just spontaneously never heard before on the earth the song erupts forward in pure joy. I don't, I don't know if you've got a good one, another explanation that works for me too. But no one knows why we sing. I get back to what, now I, don't, I forget whether it's Greg or Jim, but to me it's a creation vibration. I believe that what Genesis says that God spoke, through Jesus spoke this universe into creation and that his, the vibration of that creation still exists. Uh, physicists believe it's still you can still find it in stones, and the only way to change that is to change the vibration of the stone, which you can do by speaking to it. And so I believe God created song, and our bodies are, as quantum physics, which is where we come back to quantum physics, have determined the smallest particle which our bodies are composed of are vibrating. And I believe, I've said this before, I think the reason why certain songs are acceptable to us and others might not be as they, they're either in sync or not in sync with the vibration of our bodies. So I believe God, God, God gave us singing. He gave us songs. He created this vibration that we, we generate by the sound of our voice by setting the, the air in motion. And we see in Exodus 15, 1, the first time that the word sing, sang, and sung is used. And the children of Israel has just been delivered across the Red Sea. The, the waters were parted. They've come over. They're on the other side. The Egyptians' army have been wiped out. And Moses leads the people in singing this song. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. They call God song. And he has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will extol him. And he goes on for 17 more verses and ends in the Lord shall reign forever and ever. Now I couldn't help but think, as long as this is, how long did it take Moses to teach the children of Israel to sing this song? Because I know how long it takes y'all sometimes to teach, to, teach, to teach you a new song. You get a lot more people out there. That's true, a lot more people. But I, I just found it, it, it marvelous that having been understanding a little bit about salvation, have been set free, having watched the Egyptian army get swept away, their first thing they wanted to do was to worship God, to praise Him. In song, And this is the first time we see song in the Bible. Then there are a number of, of verses. Some people say they're commands. I say there were more instructions to sing praises to God, sing praises. 
And you could almost list all 150 psalms if you wanted to. to right. <laughs> <laughs> but in the interest of time, I said I wouldn't do it this morning. So I'm... But then we've talked about this a number of times before too. Why are we hesitant if we're instructed to sing and song and, and worshiping God is such a, an expressive uh, activity? Why are we hesitant to exhibit biblical displays of worship? Why do we stifle the Spirit's prodding? Because we want to be in control. Sin makes you stupid. We're stupid. Fear. You know, that thing about church culture and the church of my youth, I still, my mother still attends the church that she and my father first visited in 1948. And it's the church that I grew up in, and I'll still, when I visit my mother, we'll go, we'll go there, we'll tend there. It's changed a lot over the years. But one thing that hasn't changed is even yet today, when I go to worship service there, you rarely see anyone raise hands. It's just not culturally acceptable. More and more people, you, you see occasionally, because they, they're, they're new members, they've transferred in from some evangelical church. They hadn't quite got the program yet. And they'll kind of raise their hands. And what I find interesting, and I love the spirit of it, people know they should be doing that, but they don't want to do this because some old man or old woman will come and say something to them. So they put their hands down here. No one, they, they're lifting their hands, but no one can see them. And I find it interesting, and, and I, but because of that cultural uh, aspect of what's acceptable not in worship, I feel my worship is stifled there, although I can still worship to the songs and marvel in the music and so forth. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. So this fear of man, this fear of being too much movement, too much responding to the Spirit within the culture and, the, and the, the, what's, what is acceptable in a corporate service. We say, well, I don't want to do that. I'm, I'm more concerned what someone will think about me. They might think I'm weird and I'm really out there in left field and wonder what kind of church service I listen to when I'm not listening to Lee and what kind of music I listen to when I'm not in church. In Isaiah 51, 12, 13, we see again, I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies and the son of man who is made like grass, that you have forgotten the Lord your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth that you fear continually all day long because of the fury of the oppressor as he makes ready to destroy but where is the fury of the oppressor? So God is saying, I created everything. So why are you afraid of a little old man who's making a lot of noise? Respond to me. You know me. You know what I've shared with you. You know what I've encouraged you to do. You know what I want to hear from you. Worship me. Bob Coughlin, who's the director of music for Sovereign Grace Ministries, had posted a, a message he brought on worship. And he had this statement in there, which I felt, thought was really interesting and true. If my worship is controlled by what other people might think of me, instead of by what God has revealed about himself, who am I really worshiping? Again, if we understand the depth of our sin and what it was Jesus has done for us, and we have a friendship with Him, a fellowship with Him, and we sense His presence while we're worshiping, we should respond the way He directs us to. Paul says in two letters, which I've used in a number of times, he says this, but in Ephesians 5, 18, 20, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. Dissipation is kind of debauchery or frivolous activity. It's a waste of time is what dissipation is. Dissipate. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, 
singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. So again, Paul's instructed to sing together. Why do we use psalms and hymns and praises and worship choruses, spiritual songs? It's been part of the church history. And in Colossians 3.16, well, more important, church history. Because what Jesus, I think, wants to hear. It's a way in which our bodies, we can create sounds and noises and expression that you can't in any other way. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. A key word in here that I had not picked up many before was admonish. So in our corporate worship, where we're increasing the fellowship among ourselves, encouraging one another and so forth, through the words, not through me, but through the words of, of psalms, of spiritual psalms and so forth, we admonish people. And I, and I don't know how many times I'll, I'll pick up on a lyric that I've, met, I've maybe been singing for 60 years, and suddenly, out of nowhere, BAM! Wax me upside the head. So if the motivation, the reason for my worship is my love for Jesus, nothing else matters. Amen. What is God's response to our worship? We pray this many times. In Zephaniah, which is a book I'm sure all of you are intimately familiar with. <laughs> Verse 17, the Lord your God is in your midst. And we believe that. If one of us walks in here, we know God came in the building, if he wasn't here before, but he was here. A victorious warrior, he will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. Now, Lee has told you, God is seeking worshipers. Why have we find them? And I love it's the, the contrast, shouts of joy and quiet in his love. So if you're in a real slow, soft worship experience, he's there with you. If you're dancing around and waving your arms and throwing flags, whatever you're doing, joyous in your exaltation of worship and praise for him, he's doing the same thing. And I love the picture of him dancing here over us and shouting with us and singing with us. I'll go ahead and say this, cause I may say it later and I may not, but it occurs to me. I know many times we may get hesitant about singing certain lyrics and songs. We had a member here, there was one song we did, he said, I can't sing it because I don't mean it. It's too perfect. I believe God knows our heart. And while we may sing certain lyrics that are in and of themselves not necessarily true with where my walk might be today, I know God believes my heart, and He, in His grace and mercy, covers that over. So there's no reason not to sing this song, but to see something, well, I don't quite live that way. Oh, Jesus, I want to. And He hears that. Yes, amen. There are many ways to worship. We could do silent meditation, and sometimes this is a marvelous way to spend God, to spend time with God and worshiping Him through prayer, reading God's Word back to Him, just talking to Him. And one of the most common ways, though, is music for the reasons that we've, we've touched on already. I believe, as I said, music was created by God. Since everything was created by Him, music was part of the, the creation vibration. And it's the vehicle through which my mouth or my fingers on strings or piano keys or whatever causes vibrations that resonate with the vibration of creation. And I think that's what we do when our voices set these molecules in motion. And it's because it's coming from a heartfelt belief and heartfelt desire to worship, it gets to the heavenly realm. Now, I have to be the first to admit, and I've said this before, not all songs I hear on Caleb are acceptable to me, either because 
Uh, it's got great music, perhaps, but the lyrics are sophomoric or just bad or bad theology. And so we have to be, you know, let the Spirit direct us in when, we, when we listen to songs, and we do this when we select new songs that we bring to you to sing here. Make sure that we lay them before Him and they are theologically appropriate for us to be singing. And I think part of the problem is that Christian music is unfortunately a business. And I've heard some CDs, I've got some, of someone like, I won't, I won't mention any names so I won't get in trouble. But well-known worship leaders, they've written marvelous songs. I mean marvelous, spirit-led, wonderful songs. And then a CD comes out and it... And I believe it's because they have a contract that says you've got to give me so many CDs in a period of time. And so they write, the, the music is not inspired, the words are not inspired. You can, they say the first three words, you know what the rest of the song says. And I'm not saying people can't worship to that, but I don't, that's not what attracts me. So why do we use hymns and choruses? In case some of you know, I had to use one Greek word in the message this morning. <laughs> So, so I get my A. Hymn comes from the Greek hymnos. I'm actually going to use two words so I'll get extra credit. Comes from the Greek hymnos, which is just simply a song of praise. Now, have we seen music's been part of worship since Moses? Many of the original, many of the original hymns and many hymns that we sing today are based on psalms. In fact, I don't know that the church, but there's one church, if the hymn is not a psalm, they won't sing it. The only songs, the only thing in their hymnal are the 150 psalms put to music or a chant or something. There hasn't always been congressional participation in the singing or music of the church, especially in the early church when many people couldn't read. Uh, so you had the monks singing or there'd be some choir that would sing. And they did chants and choral music. Another story time. Old time church service, and you can still run into this. When I was growing up, you only had one worship service. Sunday school was at 930, and church was 1045 sharp. Probably this church over in Indian. What is it? Not Indian Springs, Indian Hills. No. Idaho Springs. Idaho Springs. That was one of the springs. <laughs> Starts at 1045. And one of the things I miss that was common in church service then and you will still find in traditional services today is an organ prelude so everyone's standing around talking you got out of you got out of uh, sunday school at 10 30 and you're milling around the kids are throwing things and eight paper airplanes start to go through the air then the organ starts the prelude and the purpose of that was to try to get you to settle down get your seat get your spirit into condition to, to do some worship then the choir would file in and then they do a call to worship and then normally you'd start off with the first hymn the hymns in, in, in this time and even today are on two two boards up on the front they've got the, the list the hymn number we learned early on that they're not hymn names you don't say Let's sing holy, holy, holy. You say, let's sing hymn number one. Because that was the first song in the Baptist hymnal. <laughs> so they'd have the hymn number so you'd know what they were. And if you wanted to cheat and look ahead, you could see what they're going to be if you didn't know them. And then there'd be announcements and welcome, thing like that. Then there might be another hymn. And then there'd be some other announcements, talk about Sunday school attendance and so forth. And there'd be the offertory. And the choir would sing. Then the preacher would preach. And then there'd be a, a call to a, a hymn of invitation, and that was it. Now, I don't remember ever worshiping as a kid. I sang pretty songs, and many of the songs I love to sing now that we sang this morning. I love to sing, and I love the harmony of it, and I loved, I loved doing it, but it really wasn't worship. It was just singing a nice song because it was so structured. And the only time I can remember anyone in the whole congregation, and would include my mother particularly, who would get animated and excited about anything was if that preacher dared preach more than 15, 20, 25 minutes, and you were not out the door at 12 o'clock sharp. That preacher, what's he thinks going on? We got chicken to fry, we got restaurants to go to, we got stuff to do. 
How many memories is this bringing back? <laughs> and it's sad, but this that still is, is true in a lot of churches today. In my visit in North Carolina last, last year, I, th- I shared this, I think. One of the churches I wanted to visit was uh, the First Presbyterian Church of Wilmington, North Carolina. And the reason for it is most of my cousins in Virginia are Presbyterian. And I've got nothing against Presbyterians. But I was born in Stanton, Virginia. Woodrow Wilson was born in Stanton, Virginia. And while I'm not a big fan of Woodrow Wilson for a variety of reasons, his father was the preacher at First Presbyterian in Wilmington, North Carolina. And Woodrow spent two or three summers there as a young boy swimming in the river. So I just wanted, from a historical perspective, to visit the church. And it was, it was marvelous. The place was packed. Everyone was wearing suit and tie. I mean, you talk about tradition. It was traditional church. But the hymns that they sang, and the and music was free, and the choir was in the loft up there, but they faced each other, not the congregation. And it was nice to sing the songs, and the message was nice, but it was really too, it's too, too formulaic. I don't like. I don't think I'm better than they are because they worshipped and they had. It was obvious that people attended there because God is there and doing things through that church. But the way I desire to worship now is different. So that's an old time church service, and I like what we do better. Can worship be too long? No. Can we sing too much? One of the things I most enjoyed, you don't see this in, in a lot of churches today, is the way we do it where we have a, a, a time set aside for worship. The problem with if you sing a song, do something, sing a song, do something, sing a song, do something, someone who really desires to worship may not get drawn into it and the song's over before you know it, especially as Lee mentioned last week, you sing the first, second, last, first, third, and last, or first and last. And so... At least the way we do it, and I know know, we don't expect you to stay in the whole time. You do what the Spirit leads you to do. But if you don't get wrapped up in the first song or the second song, you know there's going to be time. And, 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 And for people that can get into it right away, it's a marvelous time of worship to just spend time. I hate for it to end. I hate for the sense of the spirit of, that's on this place when we finish worship to get broken by what we did today, even with the offertory. Or a message. Can we sing too much? No. There was a, I forget now where the church was, but a, a, a couple had visited the church and they were talking to the preacher afterwards and the preacher said, so how'd you like it? The guy said, I won't be back. And the preacher said, why? He said, y'all sing too much. (laughs) I love hymns. I love the hymns that we sing this morning. The theology in those hymns is magnificent. I believe that hymns, most of the ones, especially the ones we sing, were in spirit inspired. Some of the, the, the turn of phrase that you read, the, the melody that was composed, There's no way man wrote that. And to be able to tap into the revelation that that God gave this person to write this song, I said man, it could have been obviously a woman, uh, because some marvelous hymns we have were written by women. But hymns, by and large, are marvelous in their music and their theology and so forth. It's sad, I think, I noticed Marcella brought hers this morning that we don't use these much anymore. Because I think, although the use of overheads is certainly, it helps things flow. It has an economic component to it for a lot of churches. But not using hymnals, we're missing something, I believe. You learn four-part harmony in one of these things. Of course, I like to hold a book. (laughs) I bought a nook couple weeks ago and while it has its attraction it's not the same electronic stuff but I miss this that we don't have the four parts harmony and if for some reason they only sang the first second and last verse you can see what the other verse was when we learn new songs because you don't have the music if you haven't heard it you don't know 
the flow of the song. You don't know the tune. You, may, you don't know how long to hold certain words and so forth. We have to hear it. We learn by, by our ears, which is okay. But I, I miss using this. What makes a good worship song? Now, this is me. I believe based on revelation, <laughs> at least for me. It needs to have a pleasing melody for me. It doesn't have to be in a major key, major where the chord progressions are all nice and, and so forth. Minors can be a little disconcerting from the time. I love a song, though, where, where the minor and major is like low in the grave. He lay, it starts off in a minor key, so it's kind of like a dirge or a lament. But then up from the grave and it switched to a major key and the whole thing changes. It's a marvelous song. But it needs to have a pleasing melody. Many times I will get a CD and I, first thing I do is I preview the songs. And if a song doesn't, for either because the introduction to me is discordant or something's messing about it, if the melody doesn't hit me first, I just pass over it. But many times, either weeks or months or sometimes years later, I'll have an opportunity to listen to a song I'd passed over and say, wow. And I brought many songs in that way that we didn't pick up the first time. But sometime later, either perhaps, praise the Lord, I have matured and I learned something. And there's something about that song. But for me, it needs to be a pleasing melody. Theologically sound lyric, we talked about. Spirit inspired. This is why I think there's only one hymn, and I can't remember the name of it, the only one hymn we do, we don't do all the verses. And there's a reason for it, and it, to me it was because that, whatever that verse was, it didn't seem to fit, or it, someone had added it, it didn't, it didn't make sense in the song. But I decided when we started doing hymns here, and I became your worship leader, we'd sing every verse. Because I believe if it's inspired by God, then we should hear everything. And as Lee said last week, when you skip verses, there many times is a point about this, that you need to understand before you get to that last verse that you miss. It's what, I'm, I can't believe I didn't know there were more than four verses to Amazing Grace. But to have found those two additional verses makes that last verse so much more meaningful. And to me, what makes a good worship song, it's easy to learn and sing. My heart soars when one of y'all come to me one Sunday and said, that song we sang last week, I've been singing it all week. Because I know that Jesus had a reason for that song. And music many times is what we can use to lift ourselves out of a difficult day or someone cuts us off in traffic instead of getting all bent out of shape, sing a song. Music, because of theology in, in, the, in the lyrics, we can use to witness to people. Many times I can record the words to a song, but I can't record the verse per se, uh, verbatim. Last week, Lee discussed the importance of lyrics and how we should be aware of what we're singing. And, and this is true for me every time I sing a song. Because it, it's never about just singing words. So I'm going to spend some more time on lyrics. I could have done the whole message on just lyrics or on Bible verses. But I want to show you what, for me, how I get drug along sometimes in, in things. I was watching a Gaither um, reunion video. He did a special on the Crab Brothers. I didn't know the Crab Brothers. I still don't know the Crab Brothers. But they're three brothers. They have marvelous harmony. When they sing together, you know they're family. And they, are, they, 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 they do songs so well. And they did this song. It's a praise song. It's, it's for encouragement. The purpose of the song is to lift each other up, to feel the love of Jesus, and to share the wonders of heaven. We did that song this morning. Shall we gather at the river? Where bright angel feet have trod. With its crystal tide forever. Flowing by the throne of God. This is an encouragement. It's, it's, it's a praise song. 
but it's also encouragement. It's one where we're singing to each other in the body. Shall we gather? The answer is yes, we're going to, but shall we? Let's do it now. Let's don't wait. Put our arms around each other. Let's sing this song. But what I love about this, it comes from Revelation 22, 1. And he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Two things about this I know for sure. Number one, I don't know how clear crystal is. I can only imagine when John saw this, that's the best he could come up with. It's better than that. Our understanding, we can't get there. Same thing, what's the water of life? There's a, that's a turn of phrase you don't see. And so this song was written from that. On the margin of the river, washing up, I say wash. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Washing up its silver spray. We will walk and worship ever all the happy golden days. So again, as an encouragement, as, as, a, as a body of believers, let's gather. And we're on the margin of that river with its silver spray. We're going to walk and worship. Ere we reach the shining river, Lay we every burden down. Grace our spirits will deliver and provide a robe and crown. So again, we're saying, you know, by the time we get to that river, our burdens are going to be gone. How marvelous is it going to be? And grace has delivered us. Soon we'll reach the shining river. Soon our pilgrimage will cease. Soon our happy hearts will quiver with the melody of peace. Can you see your heart quivering? What a marvelous turn of phrase. Quiver with the melody of peace. And then the chorus. Yes, we'll gather at the river. It's a known fact. We know because we know because we know. We will gather at that river. The beautiful, the beautiful river, gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. So when you look at this song, this is, I hear this song so much differently now than I did the first time I ever saw it as a kid. It's a marvelous song. It's a marvelous hymn of encouragement to the body. Worship songs. They're for praise, joy, lament, inspiration, encouragement, prayer, worship, prophecy, healing. Everything that God can do, He does through worship and do through worship songs. Now I want to look at the lyrics of, I can't say it's the best love song ever written, but if it's not the best, it's certainly one of the best. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. I know the depth of my sin. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou, if ever I love thee. My Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow, if ever I love thee, my Jesus tis now. What did he go through to pay for my sin? To be my redeemer and my savior. I'll love thee in life, I will love thee in death. And praise thee as long. As thou lendest me breath. I'll breathe only because he's thinking of me. And say when the death to you lies cold on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus. Tis now. In mansions of glory and endless delight. I'll ever adore thee. In heaven so bright and singing thy praises. Before thee I'll bow. What a glorious 
what to look forward to. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Now, since Lee pointed this out last week, I had to discuss it. In John 14, 2, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. The Greek word here is monet, which means abode, residence, and probably because it's what Strong's does, they use the word mansion. Now, what I find interesting in the same book, down in verse 23, if anyone love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Monet, it's the same word. Translated mansion in verse 2 and abode in verse 23. Now, I looked at some commentaries that said in the King James time, mansion didn't necessarily mean a castle, a big old thing. It could have been an apartment building where a number of people were. And my point is, as I said earlier, God knows our heart. If the reason we're singing this song, the reason we want to go to heaven is to live in a big old mansion, we've missed the boat. That's not the point. Whether it's a small, we don't even know what it is. Our that's right. And what I love about it, Jesus speaking in Arabic, which was used a Greek word for whatever word he used. So who knows? But the, but the, the point is, we're going to live with him. Amen. Whether it's a tent, I don't care. Just to be in his presence is what's important. So the, the phraseology or the imagery of about a mansion in glory, it's only important from the standpoint of I'm with Jesus. And so I can sing that song, and I'm not worried about whatever translation uh, issue there may be. Now, from the, the song we just went through, there are words that stick out to me. I know thou art mine. I know. I'm resigned to sin. I walk away from it. I lay it down. Thank you, Jesus. You're my Redeemer, my Savior. You first loved me, purchased me on Calvary, loving life and death, praise, and at last I'm in heaven and eternity with Jesus. Just some of the things to get from that song. If ever I love thee, my old love source. The other song we did, I stand amazed in the presence and wonder how he could love me. If I want to get into a state of worship that's deep, think about how Jesus loves you. Amen. And it doesn't take two songs to get there. Or it shouldn't. A sinner condemned unclean, not my will but thine. Sweat drops of blood for me. Took my sins, made them his. In glory his face at last I'll see. And I'll sing for eternity of his love for me. These are the things I take away when we sing these songs. Which makes it hard to sing them sometimes. How marvelous. How wonderful. Doesn't your spirit just want to raise up? Can you just feel it coming out of your body? How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Thee will I cherish, thee will I honor. Thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown. This is one of those, do I really cherish him? Can I sing this song? Do I cherish it to the extent the writer meant when he writes this song? In my understanding, yes. Can I sing it? Yes. Do I want it more? Yes. Will I honor? Do I honor him enough every moment of my life? Whether I do, he's still my soul's glory, joy, and crown. Some new songs we've learned. and the, the, How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son. 
to make a wretch his treasure. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know because I know because I know that it is finished. Doesn't this want to make you worship? How should, or why should I gain from his reward? I can't give an answer. It's beyond my understanding. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. What a marvelous lyric. Jesus be the center of my life. This is a prayer. Jesus be the center of my life from beginning to the end. It will always be. It's always been you, Jesus. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Your heart wants something that only Jesus can give it. Amen. God of grace. We sang this a couple of weeks ago. God of love. God of mercy, all glorious, in your presence I remain. Your love filling me again. I am yours. I am yours. Behold the Lamb of God. I, this imagery still just breaks me up. When I walk into heaven, as marvelous as everything is going to be, behold the Lamb. My voice will be saying, behold. You angels can't say this. You can't understand what I mean when I say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away my sin. Amen. Lord Jesus crucified for me, this love that knows no end. And you're seeing him, your love has set me free. Then I can say to you, I give my all, I'm yours. I will be all his in heaven. So what makes a meaningful, heartfelt worship experience? How do you feel? What emotions erupt within your body and your heart and your soul? How do you express your love to Him? And how do you feel His love for you? For me, it's I feel loved. I feel peace. I feel acceptance of being cared for. It's warm. I feel energized. Happiness and joy. Sadness sometimes, brokenness for when the realization of something that I'm, of the, my sin, something that still is a hardness of heart or a veil over my heart. Of revival, rededication. Provision of answers. I feel in balance. I feel in harmony. But also want more and more and more and more and more. So what's love got to do with it? Everything. The more I love him, the more I feel his love for me, the more I love others. The more I reach the point where if I don't worship, I think I'll explode. Is that simple? Love is why we worship. Why we're drawn to worship. Why worship can change us and make us more like Him. Love for God. Love for others. We'll look at the words of this last song. This is one we're going to get ready to sing. In the context of all that I share with you this morning, let's look at these words. This is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give you praise. All that I adore is in you. Focuses on Jesus. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take. Every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me. 
Help me to love. Help me to love. Not just people that are easy to love. But everybody you put in my path. And in love for you to draw me into a state of worship. That I'm thanking you and praising you for loving me. For paying for my sin. For taking it away. So that I can spend eternity with you. Worship is driven by an understanding of my sin and my love for Jesus who took my sin away. The deeper my love for Jesus, the deeper my worship. As the worship team gathers, I'd like for you to just sit quietly for a moment. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Think about his love. Think about why you worship and in, in, in encompassing that, how you want to sing this last song to him.
of our worship help us not to give thought what man thinks but to worship only you and may our hearts always give you only the honor and the glory forever amen amen now you can sit quietly and cry or laugh dance come with us and worship him deeper come prepared to worship him next Sunday in ways that you never thought imaginable feel that peace and that joy feel that warmth that knowledge that he loves you and you know that you know that you know that you know that you're going to spend eternity with him God bless you. Have a marvelous rest of the Sunday.